Victor. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another video. And today we have our two amazing guests, uh, Tom and James. So um, like the title suggests, you know, both of them, they are like in the what, in their early 20s and they have generated over $300,000 in one, in one day in sales. So they are like one, one of the most incredible e-commerce people I know that are actually like making a killing right now. Um, so we're gonna dive deep into like understanding their story, the strategy, how they actually like do things, and their mindset that really helped them to generate this kind of like amazing results. All right. So without any further ado, let's just get right into it. And um, yeah, why don't you guys start by you know introduce, introducing yourself a little bit to um, you know the people who are gonna be watching this on YouTube. Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, thanks for having us here, Gary. Um, yeah, this is probably like before this interview, we had always kept pretty much all our results just on like for our inner circle. Like you knew mm -hmm. some of the stuff we'd done, our, like our friends, our network, they knew, but we'd never had anything public. Um, so this is kind of like the first exclusive like time we're talking about it publicly as well. So this is exciting for you guys. Like tune in, make sure you listen to the whole thing because uh, I definitely know there's going to be a lot more value here than you know, some of the other podcasts and like videos on the topic or YouTube videos I see where people are just trying to teach you how to use Oblo or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, we'll be going into like, if you're like in like right at the start, like beginner, um, there'll be stuff here, like 100% you want to tune in, find out. But a lot of the stuff we're going to cover is a lot more advanced or um, the things that matter that most people don't think matter. Um, so yeah, just like a little bit about me, pretty much I'm, I'm Tom, I uh, make music as Malapa and that's like, that's my main thing. That's the reason I got into um, e-commerce. It's the reason I got into marketing because pretty much like we, me and James have always been super entrepreneurial kids, like always having garage sales, like when we're eight or nine, like we grew up in Singapore, just like you bro. So like, you know, all the helpers and stuff that will be around Singapore, they'll get them to come and like, oh, who wants to buy something? And mom would be they're like oh do you have this and i'd run inside and be like oh mom can i sell this or like can i sell this like, no oh, like oh at least that and i'm like mom i want to want to make sales and um yeah we like probably the first marketing we ever did was in, in singapore like for people who aren't from singapore there's these things called like condominiums or like sort of living communities and um inside our living community it was kind of like one big circle like you can drive um around the whole outside of it so what we would do is wherever there was like parts where people would walk from inside, we would take chalk and we would like draw arrows to be like this way to the sale and like make like a whole maze and path so everyone could find it. Um, so yeah, I mean we've I've always we've always been like extremely entrepreneurial. But when I was and how old like, were you guys when you started like doing the you know sales thing in uh, Singapore? Um, probably seven, I'd say is like, that's like the earliest I can remember. Yeah. Did you guys start when you were seven and like, then James probably started like, like six, right? Five, five or six. Yeah, five. Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah. By the way, if you guys have, you know, I think I haven't mentioned it. I think both of them are actually a brothers. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're brothers. And, um, there was something else I wanted to say. So you might even want to update the title. Maybe not it's like a bonus, but whilst we did like that amount that you guys have seen in the screenshot in a day, we ended up doing seven figures in that weekend. And like... <laughs> so, like, wait. So, so you guys generated over, like, a million dollars in... Um, yeah, we're probably going to have to update the title. Like, so a million dollars in, like, two days. Um, yeah. Well, weekend so is, it like, was, Friday. It, it was Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So, like, you couldn't do this every weekend kind of thing. Like, you had to... We'd been timing. We'd been having everything was prepared for like, up to eight months in advance. And, like, it kind of blew our expectation with how much traffic that we could get. But um, yeah, it was like we advertised like the main big days were obviously like the Black Friday. The day before it was like getting really hot, like just traffic was coming way more through the roof. Um, and then Saturday, Sunday. And then by the Monday, we were pretty much out of budget because like we went so hard that I was like calling up people. I know I'm like, dude, we're getting a 12 bro ass on this thing. Like, can you get loans? Can we do this, that, the next thing? And um, the thing is in Australia, our credit system, it's so bad bro like pretty much for me to like especially if you want quick credit or like quick cash quick loans um without going to loan sharks because i don't even need to go in why you don't want to go to those guys but if you want to go through like, the established routes we were finding like 
for instance, there was like this one place called Nimble Loans. They were like only able to give us up to like five or 10K. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but I'm not going to be able to you know, keep this hitting where I want to hit it, right? Because we didn't even max out really the full traffic that was on, um, that was like available for that weekend. So the what ended up happening is once we had essentially gone um, pretty much every available dollar apart from like what we needed to keep for, you know, like living and um, to run the company and stuff, like pretty much the minimum we could say, we put like everything into ad spend. And then um, I was very lucky that at the time, like Gary, you know, these guys, but at the, at the time we were living with uh, two American roommates. We were living in Bali as well um, in Chenggu, like one of the best spots to live. Like Gary yes. knows that's where like we've hung out yeah. heaps of times. Um, but yeah, two American roommates and one of them, he had really bad credit, but the other guy, I don't know if he wants me to like fully share his name, but I'm happy to share like his first name and he's a legend. But Brian, this guy called Brian, Brian, Brian. You know, yeah. <laughs> he's amazing, bro. Like, Thank you, quick, quick shout out to him. He's like, <laughs> to show how next level this guy's mind is, like, he would go to this spa where we would always go, go to the ice bath where it's freezing and hold his breath underwater for like eight minutes, like 10 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do all this next level stuff. But um, essentially, he heard, like, in the video, um that gary posted you can see like the chachings were going everyone in the house was like super excited there was just like hype and um he essentially offered us like he's like yo i can get credit i'm american we can get credit really easily like if you guys have seen the big short you can see that back before the 2008 um financial crisis you, there was like strippers that had you know like three mansions like on loan and like they weren't paying them up front this is just all credit and loans that were being given out right so um he pretty much like me in australia calling connections couldn't get very much him within like i think like 12 hours or whatever he had like four new credit cards and up to like six figures in um like instant credit just like that and i was like whoa holy shit <laughs> so yeah, that was like one of the social. reasons yeah yeah well, what, was... what what got you guys into like doing um, so you're saying that you go into e-commerce because uh, you wanted to, uh, you know, pursue your music. Uh, don't really know how they relate with one another, but uh, I thought that was really interesting. But like, what? So also, what? What? What really stands out to me is like the fact that you guys were doing like your own little, you know, like store selling, uh, mm. you know, stuff in Singapore, like a garage sale store. Mm. So like, how do you guys get this uh, entrepreneurial spirit at such a young age? You know, because most people when they're like five and seven, they they're like thinking of like candies and you know, like they're little Sandy in a class that they are infatuated with. That's all they're mm. thinking about. And you know, no one's going to be thinking about doing sales. Well, so yeah, yeah well, me well, a bit of that. Yeah. to be honest, um, I think it's just more natural thing because like I remember from the earliest age going to like soccer on the weekend and like finishing the game and being like, fuck, how am I going to make cash? I want to make cash today. And so I'd go home, go get whatever the fuck toys I had that I didn't want go door to door say like sales at like eight and be like hey do you guys want you know do you want this it's really good and they'll be like oh yeah i want like that i'm like oh that's my favorite so it's like a premium and they'll be like still i don't care i'll make it but i guess it just comes from like a natural thing because as well like even in singapore like for uh foreigners and people that aren't permanent residents there it's actually really hard or like almost impossible for uh you know our age group back then to go work and we were already had like the drive to go work like well at one point we were speaking to people on like golf courses being like hey can you like pay us under the table and we'll come but where and, do like, you think work. you guys get a drive from you know because like from 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 what from my understanding right most people mm-hmm. they they're so driven at a young age, you know, because like they came from like really messed up family, then they're like, shit, you know, I gotta like you know, get mm. things out of the way. Or for whatever reason, you know, they are just like just very, very like intrinsically like driven to, you know, pursue this powerful entre- entrepreneurship. So where do you think like the drive came from? Well, I think like I think partially it's like natural, kind of like if I'm not doing something, one, I'm like we're super independent, bro. Like we cannot have like reliance on anyone we cannot have you know like people having authority or power over us we're like um happy to you know like be excluded from the tribe if it means that we can like run our own uh be in control of ourselves and like run our own um like life in a sense so um i think part of it's that part of it when i was young like if i wanted stuff like my parents wouldn't give me money 
<laughs> like if there was a brand new Call of Duty coming out, I was like, mom, can I get the brand new Call of Duty? She's like, how much is it? It's like 80 bucks. And like, I bought you a game like last month. And I'm like, please. And she's like, no, I'm like, okay, Jim, we're having a garage sale. And like, we just go find shit we could sell. Um, so I think it's like a combination. One, like, I always, like, to be honest, before, I remember when I was young, I had like this vision, like, not necessarily vision, but maybe it's arrogance, but I was always thinking to myself, oh, I'm never going to work for anyone. I'm always going to work for myself. I'm never going to get a job, which ended up, you know, like when I was 15, 16, working while I was at school, like at Pizza Hut. I mean, not, not pizza, but like Domino's and like making pizzas and all that kind of stuff, which I think is super valuable because it taught me, you know, like what the grind's really like, or, you know, like if I'm not going to um, make things work, what life is like. Um, so that kind of motivated mm -hmm. me even more. But um, yeah, I think, I think to come back to your question, like where does the drive come from? One, I think it's like our DNA. Like we're always like super independent. And then two, it would always like come from practical reasons as well. It would be like, if I, I needed to find, it was like problem solving. And I was like, no one's going to solve these problems for us if I want to achieve this or that. Okay, we've got to figure it out ourselves. Yeah, I kind of feel that one thing that the parents did really well was like not like giving you guys any handouts. Because I know in Singapore, right, people are fucking spoiled, man. You know, you have kids over here. They have, you know, like people just get everything, you know, in Singapore. It's a first world country. And I'm sure it's like that in like, America as well. So I feel that one thing that yeah. definitely did well and we all can learn from is, you know, if you guys have like kids in the future, just, you know, make them work for the stuff. You know? Don't just give them, make them work for it. I think that's like really valuable. And also, yeah. like, one thing that I want to add on is, like, you know, you guys, you guys over your time and James, right? For the audience that are watching, um, uh, listening to this, uh, these guys has been hustling since they were, like, seven or five years old. And this is, like, what? Like, a 15-year journey. So, don't just look at, like, the results that are getting right now, but kind of, like, imagine the, the dedication, you know, it took to, from there, from, for, for them to, in order to get to where they are today, right? So, don't really, like, compare yourself against, you know, other people. All right. Mm. So, I think, I think just on that comparing um comparing it's like it seems from all the study i've done on it like people always say don't compare yourself to other people i think like 100 percent that's great advice but there's this part of us human wise i think it's like survival instinct but where we do compare to be like oh are we safe or well, how was the tribe doing like am i the like last of the pack oh, i need to get myself up there's like a natural survival instinct i think for us to compare but when it comes to comparing it's like you're right like you have to take into context like everything everyone's done like you know mm -hmm. we hang out with a lot of entrepreneurs that are much older than us and some of them you know get better results than us or um have their life a bit more you know like structured or like have things that you could be like oh i want to get that i want to achieve that and like the biggest thing is like making sure you're always competing against yourself and like your vision and um yeah, just being aware of what comparison can do. Because then, you know, when people start to compare, it can lead to things like jealousy if they're, you know, feeling yeah. frustrated and they see other people having it better, which that can lead to like negative thinking, negative mentality, which then leads to you working less, which then leads to demotivation, which then like can kick people out of the game. So it's like um, the mindset in this game is by far, by far, by far, like the biggest thing, 100%. Yeah, mm -hmm. and one thing I would like to add on is like, you know, com comparison is great if you're actually using it for inspiration. So like for mm -hmm. me personally, like how I do this, I would look at someone and be like, damn, these guys are crushing and I have mad respect for them. But then I ask myself like, yo, you know, if these guys are doing so well, why can't that be me? And every single time, mm -hmm. why can't why, why can't that be me? You know, why can't I do like 300k days if like Don just can do it? So mm -hmm. if, you, if you come from this perspective, it's actually really healthy to, you know, compare yourself to other people. But um, if you're coming from a perspective of like, oh, you know what, I suck. Um, these guys, they are doing so better. Why, why am I not like them? That is not gonna be helpful for you. So mm, that, and I'm, I mean, like on that, it's you versus you. How were you doing? You know, one week ago, twelve months ago. Like, if you're improving better every single day, you're eventually gonna get there because it's just an up uphill um projection. And you know, if you're doing, if you're trying to get better every day. That's all that matters because you'll eventually get there. But I mean, like, as you're saying, like most people, they see the flashy screenshots here, there, everywhere, and they go, oh my God, I need to do that. But it's like, you know, you can't expect a hundred extra turns overnight just like that. Mm. Yeah, having like realistic expectations. 
And yeah, so definitely like the sorry, I was just gonna say one thing is like right. yeah, being someone that can take inspiration from when you see other things like that is if you have that mentality like for the audience here if you guys have that mentality that's going to take you to the next level because there's this thing in australia and i'm sure like it's, it's in singapore and everywhere else but there's this thing called tall poppy syndrome which is like if you imagine a poppy field that like grows and one poppy grows like higher than the other the farmers they come and chop it down because if you look at poppies they're like a full it looks like a it looks artistic and magical just like a whole field of red all together but it's like this thing called tall poppy syndrome that a lot of like the culture will try and beat down or attack and take down the guy who's like achieving like even in school like in sports teams if someone's you know doing fitness and beating everyone on the running track they'll be like run slower so we all have to run slower like it's this kind of this constant battle of you know some people who look at stuff and try and pull them down to their level so they feel happy versus other people who see them up there and be like he can do it he's a human i can do it and pushing themselves up yeah, I heard that's like really, really big in uh, Australia, but uh, thankfully in Singapore, it's not really like this. Not mm. that I experienced here. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm. So, guys, walk me through a little bit of uh, like you know, e- your you guys' like, e-commerce journey. You know, how do you how do you go from, you know, like making from like being completely new and then learning about e-commerce and maybe generating your first like one k day all the way to like you know generating your first like three hundred k day. How how does it look like? Mm. Yeah, walk well, through like- it. Yeah. yeah. When I was, um, so when I was in school, that's when I first started, you know, like experimenting with e-commerce and like, I think I was trying out Shopify back in 2013, like nothing that was ever, you know, major. I was going hard because I had school, football, all these things, but dad used to, um, dad used to work for Coca-Cola when we lived in Singapore and he was like the procurement officer. So he would, you know, be in charge of getting all the ingredients all around the world and like bringing them in. And when I was young, he turned me on to Alibaba. He's like, son, like, check out this side, Alibaba. It's where, you know, like, pretty much a whole industry goes to, uh, like, buy stuff, everything that comes from China, you do deals. And so before, like, I'd ever heard of AliExpress dropshipping or anything like that, I already was aware of Alibaba. And, I mean, around the same time, I saw this kid in Australia who was a few years older than me. He um, started, like, this tea company because he was like a basketballer and he made a tea to make it better for him to recover. And he started selling it and made like his first six figures um, selling. So I was like, fuck yeah, I want to, I want to do this. So um, I think around like the 2014 world cup, I started to, you know, match all of those things together. Um, I found like supplies in China that could get me football jerseys. As you can see, like I'm a big football fan, shout out man United, glory, glory man United. And um, yeah, I would import these jerseys like locally where I was living and sell them to people at school. I'd like sell them to people off Gumtree, which is like Craigslist. Um, people would come to my house and they're like, oh, I was gonna buy that one. But then they'd see the one I'm wearing, like, can I buy that? I'm like, yeah, bro, but like, this is like fitted to me and like my favorite player. So it's like, like James said, like more money and stuff. But um, I'd say like, that is kind of my first taste of, you know, like working with suppliers in China. And then, I mean, it wasn't like we were always every day doing this like, the whole time we were in school or anything it was like this was like a phase then like we moved states and as i was starting like a tea company i was like trying to do it the whole wrong way i was like trying to create my own blend i was focused on like speaking to nutritionists and herbalists and be like how can i make my unique blend before i ever start versus what i'd say to everyone else now is like figure out how you can get a minimum viable product and sell before you ever try to make like a really good product but yeah and then like so and it was always like patchy, like in school, I'd be like, oh, now I've got some free time or holidays or um, some commitments I've like pushed to the side, I can have a go again. And then it was only when I fully finished school, like I finished school, took like a month off where I was just playing video games with my friends. And we were like, we finally finished, fuck school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, I was like, okay, well, how am I going to blow my music up to like where I want to be? How am I going to get to the level that I believe I am at or am capable of hitting. And um, I was like, okay, I have to understand sales so I can, you know, like be able to, you know, close deals or get the people I want to work with. And I have to understand marketing because I was this whole time in school, I was seeing people like start their own record labels and, you know, some of the EDM DJs that are like kind of, I wouldn't say like super big now, but they have songs on the radio. They would like be on Facebook in like our groups we were in and talking about how they were marketing or, pushing their song and I was like started to realize um that you know you're not going to get anywhere in music or anything unless you 
really understand how to generate traffic, how to generate people to come and listen to your stuff, how to build an audience. So like, because of those two things, I went straight into door to door sales. And um, at the same time, I started interning at a um, e-commerce, local e-commerce company here in Australia. And pretty much that guy, he had one staff member. I came in, I was like, I'm willing to work my face off. He like fired that staff member, replaced them with me for free, which I was already doing like two to three times the work and he could save money. And, um, but it meant that I could kind of get hands on actually figuring out, testing, seeing how everything worked in the market and learning super fast rather than having to, you know, start from scratch, which I think that was huge for me because it showed me that like it was achievable um, because I was already there doing it. And the fact that, you know, at the start, like a lot of people, some of you guys might be able to relate to it, that you know, at the start, you need that belief, you need that, you know, you have to see it done, you need that, like, confidence that this thing will actually work. And it's not, you know, just some, you know, like, typical make charlatan snake oil salesman make money bullshit, like drop shipping video that like you see and people are like, oh, you can make money online. Because you see so many like now that we've been in the game for a while. It's so you can spot within an instant like bullshit versus real shit. But um, yeah, that that's kind of how it all started. And then once I finished there, once I like got helped take them to another level, um, we essentially went out on our own. And yeah, but I'll let, I'll let James talk from his perspective because mm. yeah. it was a little different. Um, yeah, so like how I got started in e-commerce, well, like basically when I was in grade eight, I was, you know, fully dedicated to doing, um, becoming a professional athlete. That was like, this is what I'm going in. This is what I'm doing. Cause I suck shit at school. Like, hardly ever passed grades like fucking was always changing schools here and there even in Singapore because as you know like Singapore fucking school culture is next level <laughs> but, um, but yeah so like did you have many mentors just sorry did you have many um what's the word not mentors uh teachers tutors yeah. like tutors outside of school me yeah like my I, I I normally I have like one or two at a time you know my my parents are always like um you know forced me to go to these mental uh, tutors but like yeah they didn't really like, <laughs> help me and stuff but uh, i'm thankful because like my parents um my, my parents are actually very like laid back compared to the typical singapore yeah. parents the typical singapore parents are fucking yeah they're crazy man they drive their they drive their kids <laughs> like they push them to to excel in studies you know it's like they have very very high expectations yeah but anyway yeah. i digress yeah so james what are you saying coming back to it yeah so I was like dedicated fully into just becoming a professional athlete because I like you know I already sucked really bad at school and I was like well there's not really like I'm not going to excel in this path but I have more of a chance of excelling in this path and so you know I was doing my own thing um and I used to play AFL which if you don't know is Australian football it's like it's a weird sport but um I was playing that and I was, you know, going like state level, that kind of thing, becoming more of the upper echelon. And all of a sudden one game, I just basically got a really, really bad head concussion. So much so that like afterwards, my eyes weren't reacting to the lights. I could hardly like actually walk straight. I was more like a drunk man walking because like I had really bad vertigo. Um, and so I went into hospital for like about a couple of weeks decided and my motivation in hospital to get out of there was again sport I was like fuck it no I need to be back I need to go back to rowing I want to do rowing I want to be back in AFL for this season so um I'm essentially kind of like pushed myself to get out of there even though I wasn't a hundred percent um and you know it was it was that bad that for the first you know couple weeks I was just going to maybe one class and just like sleeping throughout the class because my whole head and neck was all fucked up. Um, but pretty much I spent most of my like recovery time just like studying e-commerce, looking at e-commerce videos. And I was like, oh, this actually, you know, this interests me. Like, what if I could make a hundred dollars a day while still in school? Oh shit. And so it started to excite me um, and whatnot and then on the side of that I was watching Minecraft videos you know but that was for more so for study as well like how can I create a YouTube channel how can I you know get this going um and then yeah so like I had a really slow recovery period 
and uh basically fast forward to like grade 10 I had a girlfriend at the time that she had like really bad mental health issues <laughs> and uh you know like a psycho <laughs> yeah fully psycho so like I literally spent most of my time just making sure she wasn't going to do anything bad to herself making sure she was good and uh you know in that time you can imagine that you know the mental health issues would have rubbed off on me which they did a little bit because I was always like on edge worried um but then like so one day like I was a part of a soccer team as well um for the school and one day like for whatever reason the captain of the team which was basically like the leader of all the other sheep in the team um he's just started like picking on her so I had to I couldn't just sit there and do nothing otherwise well I'm gonna get bullshit from her like sort of thing so I stood up for her um basically all my friends or all the acquaintances I had were no more they're all against me I had maybe one maybe two people that were actually my friends and that was good in a way because it was kind of like a uh filter it filtered out all the bull crap all the people that weren't really you know true people in a way um but then the day came where you know my ex she moved back to Canada which was hard for me uh but what was even harder was the fact that I had to be told through her through one of her friends that she cheated on me um especially because like you know I'd, I'd also neglect my friends just to make sure she's good so it was yeah it was kind of messed up um but after a couple of days of this, you know, after this happened, uh, I noticed Tom was, you know, been interning for the past eight months, as he said before, at that guy's uh, place. Um, in, in fact, in which, you know, he played a very, very big part in taking that uh, e-com store from six to seven figs um, before he even got started. Uh, so he was doing was, that. I started to... Get- Jim, sorry, just to cut in, because before that as well, that whole time, I would like come home like, Jim, look, I'm about to send an email, bro. I'm about to like make a thousand bucks right now. That's going to like generate money. Do you want to watch it? And be like, no, leave me alone. No, leave me alone. And then like once this happened, he was like, I would just be listening to podcasts in the morning when I would like drop him off like to school and stuff. And it was like when this whole period happened that he started to be like, okay, wait, what, what, what's Tom up to? Like, what's going on here? And it like all started to click, but continued. Yeah. Know. So I, I asked Tom, like, yo, what podcasts are you listening to? What can I listen to? So I'd spend the whole time on the way to school, on the way back from school, in between classes, just listening to like Gary Vee, Russell Brunson and whatnot. And, you know, Gary Vee really resonated with me because he was, a, he is a person that sucks shit at school, but is still going to be successful. So uh, I was like, that guy can do it. I can do this. Um, and then basically, you know, I took the anger and the hurt of my ex and um, just like put a massive chip on my shoulder along with like, you know, throughout the years, people going to be like being like, oh, you're not going anywhere in life and kind of just like, no, fuck you. I'm going to show you now. Um, and then from then on, I just went 100 percent into econ did not give a fuck about school, didn't even pay attention in class, didn't um, do any homework. I was just, if I was in class, I was constantly just working yeah. on the business. It sounds a little bit like me, man. When I was 17, I was, uh, I was doing exactly what you did, James. <laughs> That's how I was, you know. Yeah, and then in between the, in between classes, being on phone calls with Tom, just like, yo, what, what do we need to get done and shit. Um, but fast forward to the start of grade 11, um, you know, at that time, we had Australia's, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think Australia's largest home builders as a client. Um, mm-hmm. And we were also ad agency work. Yeah, ad agency work. And we're also in the talks of getting a Porsche a dealership as one of our clients. Um, and, you know, I remember walking into the class, the first class of um, grade 11, which was like a business class. And they're just like, oh, so what'd you get up to your holidays? And I'd hear them, they'd ask me and I'd be like, oh, you know, just got some, just got some clients, almost closed Porsche on like a, uh, as a client and that face is just dropped. I was like, what, like, what are you on about kind of thing? Um, and throughout that quarter of the year, I just started to make uh, 
we just started to make more money than my teachers. So <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I've kind of outgrown school in this sense. Um, so like that term on holidays of grade 11, I finally, you know, after months and months and months of pitching my parents, literally going to like Sam Ovens, copying his like sales scripts, but making it like why I should drop out of school. Finally, my parents were like, okay, you can drop out of school and go ham on e-com. And um, well, just on that, it was because like I was about to, um, I was about to start traveling. But this is before like we first met for the first time, Gary. Like I was like, okay, I'm touring, going back to Asia because I'd been in Australia um, for a while. And like, because we grew up in Singapore, I was like missing it, missing Southeast Asia. And I was like, I'm going um, to start traveling the world and like do my business. And Jim was working with me. And so like our parents, they were um like super tentative they didn't want to let him go but I mean they start him him being so focused him showing them not telling them like he wasn't just like oh I want to drop out of school and then just going and playing video games at night and like texting friends like he was like focused like this is what I'm doing with or without you like yeah. you can give me and a blessing or I'm just gonna do this shit yeah and, and I mean like it, it's funny because I'd put before doing e-com, I'd put less time into actual schoolwork. And then when I did e-com, I'd be up at 6 a.m. and going to bed at 10 a.m. Just because I'm like working um, early morning, late at night, and then everywhere in between. Um, and then, yeah, after I got my parents' blessing, it was pretty much uh, me and Tom, like we moved to Bali and uh, started traveling the world. And I guess the rest is history. So what went through a little bit about like your strategy, you know, I think this is like what everyone is, who is watching this is probably like super interested. So how do you guys do your product research? You know, how do you guys like find blocks that like scale up to, you know, like six, seven figures and above? So I'd say like one, there's um, like there's there's no one set strategy for product research, right? Like every single person that's had success with Google, like there's been people in, um, since you posted that I've been speaking to like on Instagram and they've, you know, some people have done like, they've run seven figure store before they've done, you know, six figures in a month. And like every person has their own way for product research. But when it comes to Google, like when it comes to Facebook, when we're running some Facebook operations, we would create high staff for it. It was like pretty, like you can create basic systems and get them going. But when it comes to Google, you really need to, if you're the guy running the business, you really need to make sure you're on top of this. So um, essentially what I did like was, you know, some of the basics, like look for high um, volume keywords, look for, um, figure out based on keyword planner, how much is going to cost to get a hundred people to the site, figure out, you know, how you can optimize the site beforehand. So like, say you're getting one or 2% conversion rate, I'd be like, okay, this is, this might cost me $60 to get a hundred people to the site. If I'm going to sell one of them, will that be profitable? Um, how do I make it more profitable? So the biggest thing for Google, I can say is making sure you do the math and numbers beforehand. Because so, so you kind of determine the conversion rate and like the, like the, the profit per sale and like how much you're going to pay per click before even like choosing a product. Oh, that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah. Whilst like whilst we're validating it, it's like the whole validating phase at the start when we're like looking, like kind of takes the longest part because once you have it, it's pretty smooth. Like to you know like create landing pages to set up the ads, like all that part's relatively easy. But um, the biggest thing is yeah, knowing your numbers beforehand because like if there's something that doesn't have a lot of search volume, like you got to think. Say there's twelve thousand people looking for your product um, per month, right? How much is that per day? Like that's less than a thousand per day, like a few hundred people per day looking for it. And then you're going to compete with so many other people for like a, for a few hundred um, people to click and say there's like 400, like 300 people a day looking for your product, five other people looking for it. I don't know, like full on people trying to like rank for that. Like mm -hmm. you're going to, and you're only going to get maybe 1% click through rate. Like you might just be getting a couple clicks a day. It'll take you like a month before you get like those hundred clicks, right? So for one, like one of the biggest things we always look for is like traffic. We want to make sure we're going to get enough people to the site. We're going to make sure that there's, you know, enough demand, right? Because I find like there's nothing worse with, because Google, you're, you're essentially like a shop and you need people to walk into your shop to make the sale, right? Like there's nothing worse than having a super profitable product and, you can't ever scale it. Like it's reached the, like a ceiling because there's not enough people looking for it. 
right? You're like, okay, this thing gets like a five ROAS consistently for like a year. It's been doing that. And I sell one a week, you know what I mean? You're not going to be able to like grow a massive business off that. So, I mean, everything, the way that we work with everything is um, something is like using this philosophy that one of my mentors taught us, uh, Mark Joyner. He was um, Russell Brunson's first mentor. And it's called like HIME, H-I-M-E. It's an acronym. It means highest impact for minimal effort. So when we're looking at or even building um, systems, building procedures, building like, for instance, in this case, the product research um, system, I'm always trying to find what can I get that's going to get me the highest impact for minimum effort. So like if I find a product that's got like 200,000 a month search volume, and it looks like it's possibly like on Google Trends that you can see it's possibly going to get bigger, then I'll be like, okay, that's, I got that product versus like my 12,000 a month um, product. Like it's going to take the same amount of effort to launch them. It's going to take the same amount of effort to write the copy, to create an offer, to price them, to source them. It's going to take the same amount of effort. But with this one, you know, I've got 20 times the audience size. And with this one, it's like much smaller. So in that case, I'd be like, this is going to have the highest impact for like, the same amount of effort but it's going to give potentially 20x the results just because uh, you got the people there and then i'd say the second thing is when you're starting out you don't want to start trying to compete with um high uh cost per click keywords and audiences just because so how do you how would you know if like a keyword is gonna gonna give um high cost per click uh well there's heaps of like pretty stand like one there's google keyword planner which is like, as you're spending money with them, you can look on the back end and they'll give you their internal data on what stuff costs. Because like, I personally, I found that um, whenever, I, before I test and I would use, I use this tool called Keywords Every, I'm sure you guys have it before. But many yeah, times, yeah. like the, you know, the, the, the CPC, right, that they give us, is like not a direct reflection of what it actually costs mm -hmm. to advertise on Google. Some, like a lot of times I notice mm -hmm. myself, I, I got to test it in order to know like how much I have to pay per click. Definitely, definitely. And yeah. with that, so when, when specifically talking about keywords everywhere, when they're giving that, um, that CPC, that's typically just for search ads, right? Because they can measure the search ad keyword because like everything on Google is an auction system, right? So they're able to like pretty much, and with search ads, you can target directly for the keyword. So they're able to, you know, measure that data pretty accurately and see, okay, you know. This oh, so those market. are just for search ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because, okay, okay. Because on okay. Um, the big thing, if you're doing shopping ads, mm -hmm. like there's, you can't actually bid directly for a keyword. You're bidding just to get your product placed into the Google system. And then you want to do so many different points of optimization um, throughout your listing, like on the site, like post click on the ad, but you're not going to be able to decide, I just want to target this keyword. You have to figure out ways that you're going to rank for that keyword which that's like a whole science in itself. And that's probably like the biggest thing like I see when I go went to check out a bunch of the other courses and like things on YouTube. That's probably like the biggest thing that most people um, don't fully understand. Like they don't have the rinse and repeat system on how to figure out what keyword they want to continuously like rank for and get into like the top five for, which for us, like I didn't learn um, any of this from going to courses or like stuff like that. We learned it just from spending our own money and me being like a guy who's constantly testing, like in terms of like when I was in university, I had the nickname, the scientist <laughs> once, once cause well, like they'd always see me in the computer labs and there was this news thing and it was the world science fair. They wanted me to talk about how music related to science, but I mean, I kind of, it also made sense for me in business because I'm constantly split testing, split testing everything, split testing wake up times, split testing, you know, like um, diets, split testing, not so much diets, but, you know, like intermittent fasting versus not, um, how certain food like reacts to me, um, sleep, um, staff, split testing, you know, hiring strategies, like I'm constantly doing that. So when we took that approach to Google, especially at the start, like I think, Post 2020, when Google had this big like crackdown on dropshippers, like it's so easy to you know, get something accidentally flagged or like ripped off their system. But before that, we used to run ham, bro. Like we used to be able to do so much like split tests where it was like clearly that you, there would be some form of, you know, breaking some form of like TNC. But, you know, you'd have, you know, like 20 different listing variations for like products. And 
like all this crazy type of stuff. So I was able to get a lot of data on what actually impacts what, because yeah. Google's not going to teach that. It's in their best interest to make sure the advertisers do not know that. Because think about it, like they care about the customer having a great experience and they care about their platform being like representative of, you know, like fairness, right? So if there's, you know, people that understand how to, you know, like for instance, game SEO and like just get number one SEO all the time, even if it's like a shit site and it's not the very best result for that like search term, like that's not in their best interest. So Google, if you, you'll see like, if you guys, anyone here that's new to Google Shopping, um, and Google Advertising, Google e-commerce, uh, and anyone that's been in it for a while, like you'll know Google gives you some data or like some insight on how to do stuff, but they're not giving you the... Yeah, you got to kind of like figure out yourself through, yeah. um, like, you know, spending your own money, seeing how it works. So like, what I'm what I'm like really curious about is, because um, you were mentioning about the Google Shopping um, auction system and how Google actually mm -hmm. decides to bring your keywords. So that's something that I'm mm -hmm. personally interested in as well. So how how does Google, you know, de decide which keyword and uh, which listing to rank for, and how can you manipulate the uh, listing in such a way that Google is gonna you know rank a listing for like a certain keyword? Mm. So like this the like the main thing that I find that most people already know is that like your title is your title and your product image are probably the two like core like elements, right? Do you mean like product page title or like the SEO title, which can be submitted to the Google shopping feed? Well, the SEO title, like if you're doing that, that means you're doing like automatic upload, right? Yeah. But um, there's also ways that you can do manual upload. And if you manually upload, you can have a different title on your product page as compared to what it's being advertised as. And as long as they're like similar, like it's not just two completely different things, Google's fine with it. Like they're gonna let it happen. And um, so coming back to what you're saying, like how do they do the auction and stuff? Like for me, the, like this is all stuff I had to kind of figure out myself. And I had to start thinking like, how is um, one, like I just, before, before I made like the, the switch into going like Google really hard, um, back in around like 2017, LA, uh, early 28, it was like, yeah, 27, 2018 period. Like I'd just been spending a lot of time understanding manual bidding on Facebook and understanding how their auction system worked. So I was just kind of reverse engineering what I was doing there and like bringing it over to Google, like a lot of the core um, concepts. But I'd say the, the one question you have to ask when you're trying to figure out these things is like, What's if you were Google, say you ran Google tomorrow, like how would you figure out who's going to win a bid versus the next guy? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, when when you see an auction system happen in real life, like people auction a house. Right. Like if there's people bidding the same amount or people able to match the same amount, the person that has um, the ability to get a bigger loan or the person that has a more trusted credit score or the person that you know already has a few properties and can show that they have a track record like these things if they're going to pick between them they're going to pick that guy right so starting to reverse engineer actual auction systems um like facebook they have a lot of details about their manual bidding system and that really helped me a lot but um it's a lot of it's thinking what's in their best interest and then testing it and then a lot of the times the stuff works like um for instance, it's not just about some people that go in and they just will like start with the CPC as they're launching the product, um, move it up a little bit, say, set like a target CPC with Google, and then they'll just set and forget it, right? Versus I'm always trying to test like what are the different um, bidding options and optimizations that they have. Um, what happens if, you know, can I get myself to a way that I'm starting to bid really high and then as I'm getting really high listing, I bid, but like bring myself down once like the click through rates coming high. Once, you know, we're already showing to Google that people really like us compared to a competitor. And we've found there's been times where I can bid a lot less than people. So click through rate is important, high. you think? So having like a high click through rate is very important click for Google to recognize. Massive. So first thing you said was the product, um, product page title. Um, the, 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 I believe also like the SEO description associated product page title if you upload it mm -hmm. um, automatically. Yeah, secondly, is click through rate. Because mm. okay. the what thing else? is, yeah. click through rate is that's that's like the number one signal Google has to measure if people, um, if you're, if like if they're accurately putting your product in the right place, right? 
So when you go in, like things to improve click through rate is obviously, you know, like your title, image. Sure yeah, All your right. product image, making sure it's as big as possible, white background, stuff like that. But also um, the thing with click through rate is that's like Google's one of their main abilities to see if this is something that people like or not. So it's the same with Facebook. Like you start to have better ads that are performing on Facebook, your CPMs get cheaper, right? You know, as like, as Facebook saying, oh, okay, this is good for our user experience. People are enjoying this. This is good. It like, they start to work with you and help you versus when it's bad and you can see people are not liking this. You can see CPM spike from, you know, like $20 to $100, like in a very short period of time, right? So um, yeah, click-through rate is definitely something that everyone should be focused on. And one like easy way to get click-through rate up apart from what we've already spoken about is if you um, start to go through your negative keywords list, like find what what's actually showing up, where are you getting impressions, making sure that they're like hyper specific and and then starting to, you know, cull as much as you can because like the less impressions for like semi-interested people you can get and the more ones you can get for people that have purchase intent that are really it's like interested, like the more you focus on those, the higher the click-through rate is going to be, right? And and when the you better go, your ads are going to run, the, the more your ads yeah. are going to run for those keywords. Right? It's like a, um, what's the word, like Amazon do it, like a flywheel. Flywheel, yeah. Yeah, so what I just uh, what just came to mind is, um, so why don't people just find like hyper, so this is like currently, um, <laughs> I don't know if I should just reveal it. This is like currently like what I'm like doing for Google, right? Um, so I'm finding like a really, really hyper specific keywords. And then I'm finding... Um, like you know, uh, like good products for Google, uh, like unique products. They they have like good demand. Uh, landscape is like the competitive landscape looks like decent. And then I'm finding the hyper, uh, hyper targeted keywords for those products. And then I'm also using a marketing angle that is something that has not been used by other com- uh, competitors. So mm. what I want to mm. ask is, um, yeah, is is that is that like is that, am I on, on the right track? You know, finding like hyper specific yeah. keywords and then like trying to differentiate yourself from the marketplace. But although we are not getting, although the search volume say for those keywords are not very high, but is it better than um, trying to rank for like a keyword with like 100,000 search volume versus like a hyper targeted keyword with like 10,000 search volume? That's what I'm curious. I'd say if that, that hyper targeted one has purchase intent behind it, do you know what I mean? If you can see the difference between the big mainstream one is just a little bit generic. People could be looking for tutorials on it. People could be looking right. for reviews like versus the hyper targeted is something that people are really only going to look at if they want to buy it, you know, type of thing. Like they're not just going to spend their free time looking and researching it. Um, Cause the thing I'd say with that as well is like what you were saying about bringing a specific angle is um, most of the time, on when it comes to like all e-commerce, right? But specifically, you can see it a lot inside Google e-commerce. Um, people will try and compete with one another on price. They just copy and paste, you know? And they just copy <laughs> and paste it at the other people's landing page. It's so messed up. True. Yeah, they copy the price and they copy and paste. Yeah. And they, they copy the price. They usually make it just a few dollars cheaper, right? So then if there's not one guy, but say like 10 guys trying to do that to your, to your offer, to your brand, to your store, like they're all going to go cheaper and cheaper and cheaper right and it becomes a commodity type effect right where it's just a race to the bottom who can like bring the cheapest and you know what happens then the only person that wins is the buyer like all the merchants they end up you know getting stuffed because all the margin gets squeezed out right so what you're doing is very smart like you're differentiating yourself you're turning your product into an offer right because suddenly if someone's looking between gary's product and like the next guy's product and the next guy's slightly more expensive, like, and his is just like generic and looks like it could be copy pasted, look like it could be, you know, like an AliExpress ripoff. The fact that yours is like pushed to a certain angle gives them a lot more trust. Like I would say as well, go one step further and make that like an offer of some sort, give them things, which we've spoken about this before, like in our calls, but give them something that's good, that they can't get anywhere else. And then suddenly they don't look at you of, you know, like a, uh, coca-cola for two dollars a coca-cola for 50 cents they look at it as two completely different things and then they know they can if they mm. like what you have they can only get it from you so kind of like maybe giving like a you know if we go to the extent if we if you know it's a winner like giving a free book or like a free tutorial or just like going a step beyond the competitors 
right? Is, is that what you going, mean? Going a step beyond. Yeah, 100%. Right. Like differentiating yourself is like one big thing. And then making sure you get out of the commodity game, which you kind of already did it by differentiating, but just to make it even better, I would say, um, yeah, giving turning it not just a product, but into an offering. And then once you have that offering, then suddenly no one's going to look at you. So like what, do you, what do you mean by an offering? So what's the difference between an offering and a product? So I'd say like Russell Brunson's probably the guy who does this best on a big scale, like in our industry. And you'll see every time he launches a book, right? It always comes with so much other shit. Like I remember <laughs> I went to get his Traffic Secrets book and then like he upsold me to like get the audio book. And then the audio book came with, you know, access to this like, uh, you know, page which had like all these funnel hacking live um exclusive videos that were not public and you can only get them there and then that came with like um some you know he was just like stacking stuff that you could only get there so if it's like say even i don't think this is the case but say it was like 30 dollars even like free plus shipping like but the shipping and handling was 30 dollars with him and i could find the same book on um amazon for like 10 dollars like I would still go to him because I'm like Amazon just gives you the book. He gives me all the uh, access to other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's suddenly right, an right. offer and you're not comparing, like it's literally the same book, but you're not comparing them as a commodity, even though this one's cheaper, right? Because so it's kind of like giving, giving them, giving them not just the product, but like maybe the other tools that's going to help them improve the experience of why they even, you know, buy the product in the first place. Right. Yeah. So like one thing that I saw like other e-commerce stores did is um you know one of my top competitors right they they sold this product which I'm not gonna reveal and um they actually add on uh, an ebook and I thought that was really interesting. So like other people they were pricing the product at hundred dollars but they were able to get away with like hundred eighty dollars and they were like crushing it right they were like one of the top competitors mm -hmm. and all they did was just like add an add a add a bonus ebook like a nice packaging and so make themselves look legit you know make like really customized mm -hmm. images and I was like wow. Can actually do that definitely because it's like if um the biggest thing when you when you're turning something into an offer where i see a lot of people go wrong is they just start adding bullshit to it, right? and they just like get this thing and things that their customers won't really care about but if you can find like this is if you want to take it to the next next level right if you can find a competitor's unique value proposition like what makes them special in the market their usp um if you can find that and then give it away for free as a bonus <laughs> in yours, bro. You kill them, man. Like you kill them. Like I'll give you an example. This is in um like the property niche. I think it was for like flipping homes or like mortgage calculator. I don't know. There was um online back. This was like early two thousands. There was like this mortgage, like home interest. I don't know some calculator that people would buy online, and it would cost like a hundred dollars. This guy and that like his competitor just sold that. He realized that his whole market, his audience, would anyone who wanted to buy his product would be looking at that, know of it or own it already, right? So he then went and bought a competitor company for them who sold like a different online calculator for the same thing for mortgages. He bought them for like 20,000 or like 10,000, like bought the whole thing and the rights to it, took it, gave it away for free on his thing. And suddenly all his competitors, like no one bought that thing for a hundred dollars anymore because his product was like less than a hundred dollars or like a hundred, who knows? It was like something similar, but if they know they can get the same thing for free from him that these guys are trying to sell, like, what are they going to do? They're going to go straight here. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like this whole, like this stuff isn't something that will like be mm -hmm. like learned overnight, but it's something that I see is one of the biggest things that separates yeah. like the gods of e-com type of thing like the guys who are really dominating, like pushing like nine figures and shit, they understand this stuff so well versus um, like new hype boys that just yeah. come in and out of the market. At, so at the end of the day, like what I feel, um, like what, what I was regulating about is like, it's, it's about thinking about how you can provide the most value to the customers. But for most people who are in the job shipping space, right? Because um, it takes a lot, of, honestly, it takes a lot of effort to be an offer. It, it, you can't just build it overnight. You know, it probably takes like months or maybe like more, more long than that. So what I always tell students is, um, since we can't like really do that, right? We want to think about how can we provide more perceived value, right? Mm. So it becomes a game of like, how can we make our customers feel like we are like a, you know, really, really real brand is legit. And, and of course, you know, we do our best to, you know, deliver on our promise as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Bro. So, definitely. so one thing that I think a lot of people um, struggle with like Google ad shopping, I actually got this question, um, got this from a couple guys is, um, 
their their shopping ads just don't spend, you know. So they are, you know, they are, they are very happy. They found this product, they set up the listing, and then they find like found keywords for it. Set up your campaigns, doesn't spend a single dime. So what's the reason and how do we fix it? Um, to like it could be a few things, but the two biggest things I would try and diagnose straight away is probably either they've set up their title keywords that they're trying to rank for poorly, like Google. It's too like saturated. Do you think it's too because it's too saturated? That could um, be a reason. If it was like if they did it properly, like and they set it up and it was like looked like say you saw it and you're like, yeah, this is something that could be like a legit title that's working. Um, I would say then it comes down to their bid, right? They're probably not bidding high enough. They probably like have their thing set too low. So I'd so say they're in a competitive space though. You know, yeah. Yeah. And it would probably be worth just putting that product into a standalone campaign, giving it, you know, like maybe fifteen dollar daily budget so you don't blow it out. And putting the like max CPC to like five dollars, or like, and if that's not enough, then just keep moving it up. Most of the time, that's enough. But you'll be able to see, <laughs> yeah, right. Because I mean, there's some like you know, I, I think for instance, like ranking for like diamonds is something like twelve dollars. <laughs> twelve dollars yeah. CPC. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, have you found like, like have you found like any products that that still end up being a winning product? despite having like an insanely high CPC, like, I don't know, two, $3. Um, yeah, it definitely happens. I just don't like to start like new, new stores, new brands, new products there. I, I'm always trying to take up all the, like the money on the table. You know what I mean? Like it's, to be honest, it's, it's kind of, it's just the different, like a difference between like, uh, an e like a beginner type setup and like an intermediate setup. So, and that comes down to price point, right? So, I mean, if you're selling $100 and less products, you want to go with like the cheaper CPCs because you know that you have to sell volume of them, be consistent. But if you're selling like a $3,000 fireplace, right? You can probably bid, you know, $3 on a key on like a click, um, right? Because that makes everyone, sense. Yeah. everyone who's looking for it is going to be, um, you, you don't look for a fireplace because I mean, unless you've got a fireplace fetish, but I don't even think that's a thing, <laughs> but like people that are looking for fireplaces, they're probably trying to buy a fireplace, replace their current fireplace, like get a fireplace as a gift for a friend. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. in those cases where that's like a few thousand dollars, that would work a lot because there's yeah. definitely a lot of people who start, who are very successful. Like their first thing is they go straight to high ticket, like high ticket, it google e-commerce and like what we were talking about before like low ticket google e-commerce they're they're both super viable and it's just more about right. what they're more comfortable with so yeah that that's um that's what uh yeah that got me thinking so because personally for me right i um the 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 most expensive product i ever saw i think was maybe like two trillion dollars i never actually saw anything above like like thousands of dollars so how mm -hmm. do you guys see so how do you guys do like your product research for, you know, like high ticket drop shipping? Um, personally for me, this is something I want to get into as well. And I'm sure that like, many people who are watching this might, might want to potentially pivot into finding um, products which are higher price range because you're going to have a lot more margins. And, you know, mm. from how I see it, it's the chance of it working seems to be a little bit higher than selling like a low tier product. A lot less competitive as well, definitely. Mm. Um, I mean, I'd say I'd start going to all the biggest stores like your Amazons, your like your Wayfair's, like the the places that were already like established retailers that people go to and starting to look in the niches where they have expensive products. And then from there, you can start to see, okay, um, these are their like top 100 or best selling or for instance, like the furniture niche is typically always high ticket, right? And Wayfair is like one of the biggest, I believe, I believe I'm correct. I haven't like gone to their site for ages, yeah. but Wayfair, they're like one of the biggest furniture, like e-commerce stores. So you go there, you start to see what's selling for them, what they're advertising the most, what like they're pushing in their emails, um, like start to reverse engineer them, funnel hack them, and then start to test those products on like, you know, see the volume, the search volume, go to keywords right. everywhere. Go to Google so just like, like even like going to these uh, websites and uh, looking at what these like big brands are selling, looking at what they're pushing, um, that can give mm -hmm. you a lot of ideas. Right? Especially for high ticket, because it's like, it's typically, it's like way less competitive mm -hmm. usually. And um, the biggest thing is your like high ticket key, high ticket products. Most of the time, this is not hundred percent. There's not, there's no absolutes in e-commerce, but like most of the time they're going to be much higher CPCs with much lower search volumes. So you've got like a smaller audience that costs a lot more to get in front of 
because you're selling them a much bigger product. So the, the biggest thing for that is, you know, you're not always going to have the keyword ideas for those products, right? You're not even, there's like things that I look and I can see we could sell that. I've never heard of it before. So, I mean, unless you already have like a bunch of high ticket products in mind, like, so you can look around the house and be like, there's a surfboard. Let's mm -hmm. look at that. Oh, they go for a thousand bucks. Oh, okay. There's like an electric guitar, like that can sell for it. Like, unless you're manually doing it, the best way that I find for high ticket stuff is just to go and see what the biggest guys in all the different niches are doing. Yeah. You know and what I mean? mean? The other thing is you also got to have the suppliers and the, the, the quality of the product has to be there because they are paying for, you know, a lot more for the product. Um, if you're going to ship them out like a shitty one from uh, AliExpress that you haven't even had a look at or you haven't even done your like actual product research, you're going to have, um, you know, problems on the back end with your Stripe or with your chargebacks because as well, you know, you may only be making one to two sales a day. And if you get a chargeback on, you know, even just one order, <laughs> boom, the process is gone. It's painful, man. That's really painful, man. It's like <laughs> a $2,000 charge rate is not fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the other thing. Like, that's why I like, you don't see as many beginners going straight to this because the, when most people start in, in drop shipping, they usually don't understand about taking care of the customer. And with high ticket, you got to check in with them more. You got to like basically bait, do bait emails where it's like an official like email you're trying to be like hey just wanted to confirm your order make sure everything's all good um and that you process this and you wanted it we're looking it'll probably be delivered around here and the point of that is that you're you get them to respond to it and say yes i ordered it boom 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 you're like creating evidence in the event that they do charge back so it's like if they have a charge back and they say no i didn't want this then you're like, hey, I got an email from this person where I confirmed their order. They said yes. They were like, I gave them these stats. They said yes. Like, that's that's how you go about it because um, otherwise you're too vulnerable. They can just get the thing and be like, hey, this looks like a small store. Charge back. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, you know what I mean? And how are you going to defend yourself? Uh, it's, that's actually really, really good uh, you know, advice for dealing with charge backs. Mm. So like when you when you guys are selling a product, right? Um, okay, let's say for example, I um random. I got this a like, USB drive over here, right? Mm -hmm. This flash drive, and I want to sell this flash drive. Probably will not work because this is this is like found in like, every single retail store. No one is gonna be buying on Google. Um, well, what 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 kind of like keywords are you guys gonna be using? You know, like how you guys are gonna be doing like your keyword research. And, um, and, 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 and the other question I have is, do you, will you guys find really broad terms? Like for example, this price, a USB drive, or will you guys find something like a best budget USB drive to put in your product title? I think it's best to start broad. And then as you get the data coming in for your search terms, like on your back end of Google, as that starts to happen, then you can go a bit more niche or create some new listings and then, then start to go niche. But if you start really like filtered, you kind of, cut off your nose to spite your face like you have a limited like pool to go from versus start bigger and narrow down it's the same as like a funnel you know what i mean like top of funnel middle of funnel bottom of funnel like you always want to start with the most um people at the top um and then in terms of say you're going to sell that usb drive i would go and like suddenly like start typing in the type of keywords that you know that would go like usb drive for sale usb c or usb for schools like whatever it is start to look at what's already listing for it. And then once you see what's already listing, start to see what do they got in their titles? What do they got in their descriptions? What do they have as their SEO title on their site? What do they have as their product title on the site? And then that will start to give you, like if you go and look at like 30, 40 competitors like that. So kind of like reverse engineering your competitors, especially those like top, top competitors in the, in the niche and seeing what hmm. they're doing. Okay. Because they're doing something right. You know what I mean? And when you go in to compete with them, here's the other thing where like a lot of people go wrong these days is um, when you go in into the market, you can't just like, if you reverse engineer them, you think you've got a winner. You think you've found someone who's really smashing it. You can't just go and like copy everything exactly because Google, like their, their whole system is basically run by AI now. Um, and they'll be able to flag and see that that's already running inside their system. They'll be able to see, scroll the landing page, see that it's matching, you know, like 80% plagiarism. Like remember in plagiarism checks in school, like you submit an essay and they do plagiarism. Like 
Google does that on a whole nother level. Like they take that shit way more extreme. And um, which by the way, if there's anyone still at school, one way to get the word count up F and to beat plagiarism, <laughs> just do space bar a lot, you know what I mean? At the bottom and or do text in white and then like filter it out at the bottom. You'll get the word count exactly where you need to. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you can see we're always trying to like, gamify reverse engine right. make everything in our life like kind of best for us right. like right. james didn't say this but when he was at school i was hiring my first few vas we hired like i taught him i was like bro you need to learn this he's like oh can't you do it i don't want to start doing this i'm at school mm-hmm. and i was like bro find all your assignments you don't want to do we're going to hire people to do them for you and you're going to learn that way so he was outsourcing his school work so that he could work like mm-hmm. um yeah, well, that was the other well, thing is all my assignments eventually just got outsourced. Um, and uh, I mean, when it came to essays and like exams, I was kind of like, oh, fuck. But even then, I'd just go get people to go, you know, give me a summary of this book, whether it was Romeo and Juliet or whatever, just constantly gamifying. Yeah, so like one thing I definitely got from you guys, which I think the audience can really, really learn so much, is to always, always like test and to always, always like try to reverse engineer a platform and like go very deep into it. Mm. I think this is something that uh, recently I've been like really trying to, you know, like figure out myself. And I feel like many people who are into e-commerce, especially new guys, they don't think like that at all. And one thing I noticed with people who are successful, like you guys versus people who are not, is people who are successful, they go like super, super deep. You know, they try to figure out like every single little detail that could potentially make a difference in their advertising campaign. So like mm-hmm. what's, so you say, for example, if someone's watching this right now, the, the guy is probably like new, he, you know, don't, don't really know what he's doing in e-commerce. Um, how would you suggest him to start? Would you suggest him to go with like Facebook ads, Google ads? Would you suggest him to do like a one product store, a general store? What are like the exact steps that you would take? Um, I get this question a lot. And like, definitely the first thing I'd always say is one, you got to create the environment, like first for you to do it, because there's no point starting e-commerce and then knowing that you don't have any time to do it, like you've just got two holidays now and there's no plan for how you're going to commit to it. Right. So like typically these are the main things I'm always saying, like um, always start with dot-com secrets, like Russell Brunson, like the book is a funnel in itself. It will teach you funnels. It will teach you the basic, you know, like language of the internet and marketing and how all this stuff works. And then like sort of open your eyes. I had like, first time I read that book, I had so many Eureka moments and like you don't have to don't like go through it and end up signing up for click funnels you know because the whole thing's gonna try and sell you click funnels i mean do whatever you want i'm just like pre-warning it's going to try to sell you something but that's not why you read the book you read the book because of what it like can teach you um so that's like really really important you understand you know a concept of a value ladder you understand you know importance of email lists you understand you know like how traffic and audiences and like funnels and everything really work that'd be the first thing second thing is i would say you got to be like you got to create the environment to succeed right so like for me the biggest thing is when it was just me like it was literally me and my little bubble like jim was at school i stopped you know working with the people i was working with um and it was just me like at home just grinding and so i would start my day every morning by like finding the mentors that like i had already vetted that i trusted that i knew were like legit and getting their podcasts like um, downloaded on my phone. So I'd wake up 6 a.m. I'd go on like a one hour walk as soon as I wake up. Because like when you first wake up, that first hour of your day will set the tone for the whole rest of your day. And you're most vulnerable mm. psychologically. So I just get in there and get all the positive mentors that are just like blowing my mind with just excitement. Like you can do this and you can use fax ads and you can do this. And what a YouTube pre-roll running to that? Like all these different things. And that basically create it helped to create like the mentality or like create the momentum that i'd have mentally so that whenever i faced problems it'll be like no these guys are smashing i'm seeing these guys do i'm hearing about that oh i know how to do that or i would at the very least be more positive because you know this is scientific but being in a positive mindset solving problems statistically you have a higher chance of beating them than if you're pessimistic or negative like this isn't even just some woo-woo shit. This is like science. Go look it up. Remember the scientist at uni. Yeah. So <laughs> so one thing I, I definitely I took from you guys is um yeah, getting like a personal life in order. And I think people they don't really understand the magnitude of this. Um and um like so many people who are successful, right? They they are not just only good at business strategies like you guys are, but they also have like their personal life in order, right? Like you said, you know, waking 
mm-hmm. waking up and making sure like the first hour is like you're you're listening to things which are you know um re- reinforcing the your positive psychology and making sure you have an environment of like winners around you making sure that you know you're like constantly learning and growing um, but what about like the business side of things you know like how would you approach like, the business side of things say for example the guy is like super duper driven he like really wants to make it happen mm-hmm. everything is like is good then how would you like kind of like, move forward from there First thing I would say, like, as you're, you're obviously that guy, the super driven guy who's new to it, he's going to want to learn. He's going to have like an appetite for learning. Right. I'd say mm-hmm. the biggest thing is start, start to forget about anyone who's like just modern age, like kind of um, like flashy, trying to lead with anything in their marketing, like the OG Ty Lopez strat. If they're trying to lead with like a Lamborghini to get you interested, like I would start to move away from that and move towards right. like old dudes with gray hair who like um who are vetted like over 50 years like people like um jay abraham people like um gary halbert one of the greatest copywriters who've ever lived um ben Savenga, people like mark joiner like people who like mark joiner literally created the first tracking pixel the first ebook like what does that guy know if he's been doing like internet marketing and uh, this whole like digital realm is pretty new but all these guys, they were doing this shit before the internet existed, right? How? Like, just the platforms have changed. So I went, like, straight to the senseis almost. And, like, oh, the biggest change I found is when I started just having mind on for, like, the senseis versus, um, you know, the young kind of Ty Lopez duplicates. Yeah, and um, on that, most of these uh, Ty, Ty Lopez duplicates, they're trying to sell you a method or a strategy for ads. They're not really like, yeah, tactics. They're not really, you know, going to the fundamentals of what marketing really is. So from like what I'm understanding is like really being aware of whom you're learning from, right? Like really, really vetting whom you're learning from. Because I think this is something that I really struggled with when I first started. You know, there was like, it was really funny, you know, when I first started, I followed this guy. Um, I want to say his name. So I really, really believed in him, man. I really, really thought this guy was the shit. I was like, damn, this guy's making seven figures month, like 45% profit margin. He's crushing his name in life. Turned out he's like a freaking scammer, you know? He was like the part of the biggest scammer in e-commerce. I was like, what? Oh. <laughs> so oh, I definitely like being very aware of like whom you're learning from and uh, making sure that you're also understanding like the fundamentals of like marketing and copywriting is what I got from you guys. No, because because one thing to expand just on what you said there, it's like, are you listening to or having any influence from? Like, uh, it's not just listening to, but it's like if there's people who you can you spend some time, you figure it out. They're making their money from selling courses about the thing, not from doing the thing, or like selling any sort of uh, any product from just how to do it. But they aren't doing it themselves. Like, I don't even like allow this. I don't want to hear about them. I don't care about their existence. Like, I don't follow them on Instagram. I don't want to see their stories. I don't want them subconsciously, you know, like playing on my mind in, in ways I don't know to get you know, me, you know, like to start comparing or like all this, you know, we understand like psychology and like consumer psychology. I just want to cut them out because if you're, if there's people that are making money from selling on how to do the thing and not the thing themselves, maybe that works for some people yeah they but should not learn from them 100 percent not learn yeah. from these people yeah you'll never get to the like the the top because they yeah. they haven't even validated that they can do it like maybe they did it once like if they just do it once and they're trying to um they're trying to like show oh this is this thing that like we did oh my god yeah learn how to do it and it's clear that they kind of fluked it the more like you go yeah. through like most of them they get spun out of the game anyway and they're like an e-commerce expert one week crypto expert. <laughs> it's, like a bio expert yeah. it's true and it's like versus like yeah. all three of us all of us have been for like over five, five years, years at least yeah. we've known each other just doing e-commerce we've never spoken about other like crypto shit we've never spoken about real estate we've never yeah. spoken about you know like I, I don't know i don't even know like we stick to what we know we stick to our 100%. game because like yeah. we do what we do and then if we're helping people on the side or whatever, it's because like we're actually doing it, doing the dance. Yeah, and it's 100%. the same with like yeah. Gary Vee. Like he doesn't need to prepare a speech like all the other people on his like expo if he's speaking at because he's just like literally living the life doing it and then going on and talking yeah, about it. He's just saying what he's thinking, like just in a moment. He doesn't need to, mm-hmm. you know, they, they don't need to prepare at all. This is because that's your life. That's what they want to talk about. They just talk about what they 100%. want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So like finding like a like a really good mentor and uh, making sure that the mentor you're learning from is like someone that is hundred percent um hundred percent better better walking right. the walk not just talking the talk right 
and I think and I think a, a second thing that I would just add on on top of what I just said, this is just based on my personal experience, is is having having a sense of the mentor's intention, right? Because like there's so many people out there like teaching and stuff, right? Um, personally, I found for me like what is the the what feels like the most authentic. If say I was to work with a mentor, if I first uh, if I'm first starting out, is to find someone that actually like really care about your success. You know, I think yeah, I think it's really hard these days. You know, people they just want to take your money. But if you can find someone who not only have the results proven to like actually help other people, that actually care about you as a person, that actually wants to see you succeed, I think that is invaluable. You know, because because that person is gonna go through a lot of hoops just to make sure that you you know you get your shit right. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. definitely definitely like um for instance right now like anyone we we have never really done like a great deal of consulting we've always just focused on our business and stuff but everyone we've worked with in the past has like a hundred percent success rate because i'm making i only hundred like, percent success rate that that's what we're with, talking about man hundred yeah, percent success rate yeah. because you need to like and i know you're the same it's like if you when you have a hundred percent success rate that's what matters you want to keep that hundred percent success rate like and that's why, you know, we would vet people that we work with so intensely, making sure they're the right fit for us, not just that they think we can work for yeah. them. It's like, hey, I want to work with you. You're cool. Here's some money. I'm like, no, whoa, I want to, I don't know anything about you. I don't know if I'm going to like gel with you, get you results. Like, I don't know if you're like somebody that I vibe with personally, because like, even then, if I can see someone's like super arrogant, someone's super like showing these tendencies, I'm like, are they going to listen to me when I tell them to do something that they don't, they've never done before and will blow their mind. It's like, Mm -hmm. so um, that's the biggest thing, like having, and I'd say the other thing there is long-term intentions, right? There's a lot of people like, I don't want to like shit on anybody, but people know if you're in the space, you know, there's people there that just care about your money up front and then they just forget about you and you move on to the next thing and don't care, right? Versus like every single person, this industry, one of the biggest things I've learned is this industry is so small, bro. Like between us three, we probably know most of the main players in this game. Like when we talk about them, do you hear what this guy's doing? Oh yeah, I heard I heard about that. Like it's so tight at the very top because only like two, one or 2% of the people that ever try to make money online ever do. And then a smaller percentage of that are able to do that consistently full time. Right? Yeah. So and the thing is most of them who are really, really successful, they don't talk about their success. They are like, you know, the silent billionaire is like living in his own mansion and not sharing anything. No, it's true. Like, like I was saying, this is the for us. We we like to keep because you can move fast that way, right? Which is like we haven't spoken yeah. about you know this seven figure weekend before, and this is like the first time we're it's doing it. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like um, the the thing is as well. Going back to my earlier point is long term versus short term because you know we know this space is small. We know that people that know their shit and are the, if they meet the criteria, like we know that they're going to be in this industry probably for the next five, 10 plus years. And then maybe, you know, they come in and work, um, do some consulting or something, but maybe in like three years time, you could partner on a business together or you could do X, Y, Z. Like that's the mentality whenever we're looking to work with someone that we're coming from, because otherwise I think it's just a waste of time just to, right. like the other people who just come for short term cash because- 100%. That'll yeah. just come and go and then it's done. And it's like right. just burning an audience, ruining yeah. your reputation versus So I know I know that yeah, I know that you guys are like um like uh, currently also like trying to get in consulting, right? So what is like the strategy that um you'll be I know you it's, it's not right for you to share like everything, but I wanna have like a general sense mm-hmm. like are you guys gonna be teaching like Facebook ads, Google ads, like one product store, general store, niche store? What is it gonna look like? So for example, if someone is watching this, right, they may actually be potentially interested in working with you one to one to you know, to succeed like hundred percent success rate, right? It's pretty amazing. Um, mm. so what, 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 what should they like? You know, expect from you guys? Like, how is the, you know, how is it gonna look like in terms of like the strategy and yeah, everything? It it kind of depends on the what the person needs. Like, um, you know, if they need help in Facebook, we can do that. If they need help with a uh, conversion rate and that side, we can do that. I know some people that we've um already vetted. You know. It looks like their main issue is systems and procedures and building a team. So it, um, you know, it really comes down to what they need and uh, how we can serve them better. So let's say, for example, someone is because from what I what I um, experienced in my journey of e-commerce, like most of the people I work with, they are kind of like new. Um, some of mm-hmm. them they have tried e-commerce in the past, but they never really got any to work. So say, like, for example, the person is in that um, in that scenario, mm-hmm. how would you be able to help them? Like, are you going to be teaching them like Facebook ads, Google ads? Um, What is it going to be? 
so I'd say like the biggest thing is like right now, because like we run our own brands and stuff, where we are doing some consulting, we've only opened up like five spots. And this is kind of the first time we're talking about it publicly, like announcing it. One of the spots is already gone. And another one of the spots, a guy's like in, but he's just waiting for his processor to pay out like a lot of his held money. So potentially, I mean, his spot's still up for grabs, first come, first serve, but there's potentially only like really three spots left. Um, but primarily, we, we won't take anyone um, from nothing to something, right? If they've, if they've never made a dollar in e-commerce, we probably aren't the mentors for them. Because, you know, I'm, I'm interested in taking people from good to great. Like if they've had success with Facebook and they want to come to Google and they want to learn from people who know what they're doing, I can help them. I can actually get guarantee that they're going to get like results. Um, we speak to them. We understand what they know. So do you guys like teach at Google or, or Facebook or do you guys like teach, uh, are, are you guys uh, able to like, teach above there? We, we can do both, but I mean, it's more so it's what James, I think what James is trying to say is that we're not just offering one like stacked, like rigid thing. Like we have, we have um, talks with people. We find out what they need, what they're lacking in. Um, so you have expertise then, in just like the general e-commerce area and you can teach anything within like the realm of e-commerce, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd say primarily like we want to stick to Google, like taking people into Google e-commerce or taking anything that happened Google e-commerce to the next level. But for instance, it's like there's a guy we were speaking to who he said he had like a, a big product that was doing 10k days on facebook but he realized that facebook was just you know like a hamster wheel so we shut it down. it is a hamster wheel yeah it and is. i keep finding that the next new product just... it's true but like he um he shut it down so that he could because he had no time to focus on anything else right so one thing we spoke about is like okay we're going to start with google we're going to get you set up there we're going to do all these things and then from once we get done, we're going to start working on teams and systems so that you can get that offer back up and maybe spend an hour a day maximum, like managing it. Right. So that's like, obviously you can't just make a step-by-step -step, like rigid package. So when we do like the individualized, uh, everyone is like customized for everything. For yeah, like, yeah. Super, it's super personal, but I'd say the main theme is like Google, Google e-commerce, and then anything else around that. And yeah. like, if there are people here that you guys are interested in working with us, like when we hop on a call to vet you out and like, we'll like, we'll speak with you first back and forth. Cause there'll probably be like a lot of people. We can't just hop on, you know, like a hundred calls, like, and have a hundred hours. Like we're not doing that. We're going to save time. <laughs> but if there's, um, when we, if we do hop on a call, like to, to vet and to see if we're going to be a good fit, like we'll, we'll figure out, you know, exactly what are the things that are going to, you like the high me steps that could take you like to the next unlock to take to the next level. And then we'll have a discussion about that. And then we'll be like, okay, if we're going to work together for these like 10 weeks, two and a half months, like these are the deliverables that like, we set the result. Okay. This is the outcome. Like these are the measured things. Right. And it's, if it takes, if we're able to work together and hit that way earlier, then that's that's the goal of the consulting to like hit these things right which are measurable if it takes longer because we're invested in the outcome right we're going to spend that little bit extra going over to make sure that it happens right like if there's delays and the other thing is like similar to how you work gary like everything will be one-on-one -on -one with us like this is not you're going to speak to tom and jim and then they're going to outsource you to some kid who just joined their team and then you speak to him it's like no like the reason we're vetting people and the reason why we're working with only a small handful is because it's guaranteed success. Almost, it's almost like guaranteed success, basically. You know? Pretty much, yeah. Like yeah. if we, if you're the right person and we vibe mm -hmm. with you, it's pretty much guaranteed success. As long as you come with the right attitude and you're, like I said, not being arrogant. Like you're going to implement yeah. what we say. Yeah. Like we're going to work together. Like you bring all those things. Yeah. It's kind of like a no brainer. And that's like- And how much should I, someone I expect to, um, how much, how much uh, should someone expect to like pay? You know, um, well, at the moment, I'm sure this is something that many people probably are thinking about if they, you know, really want to work with you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, at the moment, so for these five people, it's, um, well, one's already gone. One's like in reserve. So like potentially the last three spots, let's say, like we're doing like an kind of early bird price for this group, which is like 6,000 US. And then we have a bonus in there, which is like, if we hit, um, like when we speak, we set like a, a KPI bonus, which is like, if we can exceed expectations within this time and hit this target, then there's like a, an additional 1,000 US. Oh, but right, right. 
the thing is with that it'll be like something oh if we can you know create your google like operation from scratch together and it makes twenty five thousand um revenue within like that time or what just for example right like it's it will be like a no-brainer type thing yeah but it also it sounds to that- me like a very very like a regional price point so i'm sure that a lot of people are wondering is like six thousand us but for how long how long are you gonna be like you know helping yeah so at the okay. moment it's um about 10 weeks so two and a half months and then like i said before if that's that's not like a rigid thing you get to the 10 weeks right. and they're in the middle or something and we were like fuck off like it doesn't become that it's like we're there to hit the results first and if we like go really fast we get stuff done and it happens earlier like then that's how we consider it like achieving what we agree upon we need to achieve before if that makes sense yeah like, that sounds outcome, like an amazing deal you know six thousand us for pretty much guaranteed success the roi is like mm-hmm. what 100 times yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and the biggest thing is as well is that this is not like you're going to come in and we're going to give you a fish like we're going to teach you how to fish while like holding your hand and like guiding you and working with you so that once we stop working together you're going to then go on and just do what we did together but just more and more and like continue it so i mean that's why like we're really like I, i'm telling you guys those who are interested we will vet you and we're not going to accept just anyone because the people that we work with we're thinking long term we're thinking about you know like how can we make this relationship last a really long time how can we work together in the future after this how can we you know like work with you at this level then you go do your own thing once it's all working get yourself to a new level and come back and be like fuck i want tom and james in my team like having them on my like in my corner having them you know when i'm going to the boxing ring i want them in my corner how do i keep doing that because i win fights when i'm when i got them on my team like that is exactly like how we're approaching this and what we're going for awesome man so if any of you guys are watching this who want to work with Tom and James, personally for me, I, I know these guys personally. I can uh, bet for them. They are 100% legit. One of the smartest guys I know in e-commerce. Um, so how can they contact you? That's probably, you know, what... <laughs> so, I mean, as you as you saw, like in the post you tagged, we got like um, James's personal private one and then like my music yeah. one. So we were kind of like, oh shit, it's kind of like mixing everything up. So we created a brand new Instagram just today called at tom and james ecom probably put in the description that's that's the best place to contact us it'll be me and jet right now as of when this is recorded there's like no photos gary was the first follower so we'll probably do that up by the time that we get um we get like this goes live later tonight and then yeah so that's the best way to contact us then we'll probably like move to WhatsApp so we can like speak more frequently because we don't just productivity wise we don't like to sit on instagram a lot um Mm. Because it just opens the distractions and stuff. Yeah. But um, there, there's another thing I wanted to say as well is that like we spoke about it before. It's up to you, Gary. But um, there's this group chat, like this exclusive group chat that um Gary runs and that we're a part of, where we shared like this free PDF where we kind of broke down, you know, like some of the things that we do differently in this Google space that is different from anyone else that's like teaching or talking or doing anything public about Google e-commerce. And um, yeah, we wanted, we gave that away to this like really select group, but for you guys watching live now on YouTube or wherever you are on the interwebs, we are like more than happy to give that away as a free resource for you guys. Mm. And um, yeah, there's no like download gate or like funnel. Like we probably should have got someone on our staff to, you know, set it up so we collect your email address, but whatever. Yeah. It's like awesome, man. Happy. Right, so if any of you guys want to learn, whether or not you're actually interested in coaching, even if you're not, I think it's also great, you know, for you to mm. actually learn from these guys who are like really, really crushing. Um, I'll definitely leave it down in the link below um, where to contact you guys and then they can personally like, message you and ask for the PDF. I think that will, yeah, I think that will be great. Perfect. Yeah. That sounds great, bro. Is there um any other questions? Actually, I don't. Um, I think <laughs> we have been here for like 90 minutes yeah, so definitely, guys, uh, make sure to go and uh, check out Tom and James. And yeah, see you in the next one. All right. Thanks, Gary. Catch Thanks, thank you. Gary. It was a pleasure all to right. speak to all you guys listening. Yeah. And uh, we'll see, see you next ya. time.